Well, good morning. It's really good to be with you all. Thank you all for your really warm welcome. Um, Jess, my wife, and I felt yeah, so welcome and loved as we came in, so thank you for that. It's good to be with you here. Let me just pray before we begin. Father, thank you that you are here present among us. Lord, we know that our hearts are hardened to you so much, and it's only through your spirit that we can hear what you have to say to us this morning. So we pray that your spirit would be here among us and working in us. And may we again see the amazing truths of who you are and what you've done for us. And may that change our lives, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I wonder if you share one of my pet fears. See, I never suffer with this when I'm at home, but as soon as I step off a plane in a foreign country, I am absolutely terrified of losing my passport. I don't know, if I'm there, maybe going around a town somewhere, and then suddenly I, I wonder, where is it? Where's it gone? And I assault my bag, get everything out, out come the sandwiches, the socks, the sunscreen, looking for it, and all along, it's there in my back pocket. I've even got it here this morning. Um, I don't, but you see, at home, I don't worry about it at all. But when I'm abroad, I do. Maybe I'm just a plane's just landed, come into Stansted or Heathrow or wherever it is, and I check. You know that little flap you get in the seat in front of you? It has the old magazine and the safety protocol and all of that. Check it like five, six times, just because I'm like, what if I put my passport in there, got off the plane? What would I do then? Why am I so scared about losing my passport? Well, it's because I'm terrified of that moment of coming up to the border guard. They're never very friendly, are they? Um, you're there. It's a lonely place. You're there on your own and fumbling around for my passport, and I don't have it. I'm terrified of that because when you got to that point, you just want to get home, don't you? You want to get home, and you need your passport in order to do that Even when I do have my passport, sometimes I still feel a bit scared. Still sometimes feel a little bit worried. Will they actually let me in? But if I have my passport, trying to get into the United Kingdom, I should be okay. Because I think we've got a picture which shows us what is actually written inside our passport. It says this. Or it should actually be updated now because we've got a king or queen. But Her Britannic Majesty, Secretary of State, requests and requires in the name of Her Majesty all those who may it concern to allow the bearer to pass freely without let or hindrance and to afford the bearer such assistance and protection as may be necessary. Pretty formal language, but it's basically like, in the name of the Queen, please let Joe into your country. And when I'm coming back to the Queen's country, or the King's country as it now is, I think I can have confidence. That's coming into the United Kingdom. But what about when it's not the United Kingdom, but what about when it's God's kingdom? How can we be confident that we can get in there? How can we be sure we can be one of God's people? Well, that's really the theme of our passage in John chapter 3 this morning, and really the theme of this section of John's gospel. It's right at the start of Jesus' ministry. He's just done his first miracle, which was turning water at a wedding into wine. And that's symbolic of the amazing blessing and abundant life that there is in Jesus. But then in chapters 3 and 4, we get a big contrast. We see two different characters. Nicodemus, who we're going to be focusing on this morning, and the Samaritan woman at the well. Nicodemus had everything going for him. In terms of his social standing, he was a ruler, he was a Pharisee, he was a really religious guy, he was devout, he was the real deal. He had it all going for him. If anyone was an insider as, and thought they would be one of God's people, it's Nicodemus. But then we see the next chapter, which we're not going to have time to really focus on today, we see the Samaritan woman, completely the opposite. Culturally, she wasn't a Jew, not one of God's people. She was a social outcast. She'd had a messy life. She'd made some bad decisions in life. And everyone would have thought, no way. She's a total outsider. But we're going to see a shock. A shock both for Nicodemus, and then there's also a shock in the next chapter for, for this woman. Because the people who are part of God's kingdom aren't the people we would necessarily expect. See, we're going to see this morning that no matter who we are, none of us can be one of God's people based on our own merit. No matter who we are, we can have no life 
unless we are made new in Jesus. But I think this is something that we all need to hear. But I think it's something quite difficult for us to take in. Because we live in a society, and I think our hearts are like this too, that hate to have to ask for help. I know you walk into a bookshop and the number of self-help books that there are there for you to buy on all manner of topics, and they all basically have the same message. There's just a few simple steps that you don't know at the moment, but when you've read my book, you'll know, and then you'll be able to do life better. Here's a couple of titles. Um, eight rules of love, how to find it, keep it, and let it go. In just eight rules, you can conquer everything to do with love. Wow, that's a bold claim, isn't it? Or um, outlive the science and art of longevity, the ultimate manual for living better and longer. Just by reading a book, apparently, we can live longer and better. See, all of these things say you can do it yourself. You just need a few extra hints, a few extra tools, a few rules to follow, and you'll be fine. That's what we love in our society, isn't it? And that's what our hearts love. I don't know, maybe it's a guy thing, but if there's ever something that goes wrong at home, man, it's so hard for me to have to admit that I need to get someone in to fix it. I'll Google it, I'll YouTube it, I'll look at the instructions, I'll try and take it apart, try and figure it out myself before I have to admit I need help. I mean, DIY, that's what it says on the tin, isn't it? Do it yourself. I think maybe I'm at that stage of life where quite a lot of people I know are starting to get their own place um, by their own house. And often it's a bit of a project. And I've seen loads of people do amazing jobs at doing up their own place. But I had one colleague who had bought a place, only had one bathroom, and he decided he was going to gut the bathroom and completely redo it all by himself. And he didn't take any time off work either. I think it was about two weeks he didn't have a functioning toilet in his house. I do not know how he survived that. I think I definitely would have asked for help then. But you get my point. We find it so hard to ask for help. We find it so hard to admit we're not good enough by ourselves. And spiritually, we find that hard too. But it's a truth we have to. To hear, and it's a truth we have to understand. We have to let it sink right into our very hearts and souls. Because without realizing that, we will not know true rest. We will not know true peace or true joy or true life or true power or true hope in Jesus unless we first realize we can do nothing by ourselves. So walk with me as we come through this chapter that was read earlier in John chapter 3. And we're going to see this theme and then see the hope there is. And we're going to do that through four Ps, or one's a bit of a cheat. Um, first one is approach. We're going to see Nicodemus' approach, or Nick for short, as we'll call him. Then we're going to see Nick perplexed. Then we're going to see Nick's problem. And then lastly, Jesus' promise. So firstly, Nick's approach. Come with me back in verse 1. Now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. As we said, Nick's a big guy. He's he's a well-known figure. He's right at the top of society. He's a Pharisee. Yet he comes to Jesus. And maybe if you know much about the Gospels, this might be a bit surprising, because the Pharisees often are the people that don't want anything to do with Jesus. But here Nick seems interested. But it's interesting how he comes. He doesn't come in the middle of the day. No, he comes at night. Maybe he's trying to hide a little bit of this. And it's interesting what he says as well. It's kind of quite waffly, isn't it? Rabbi, we know your teacher come from God. No one can do these signs. He doesn't really quite get to a point He's kind of waffling his way. Maybe he's not quite sure what to say. It's also interesting. He doesn't say, Rabbi, I know that your teacher come from God. He says, Rabbi, we know your teacher come from God. I wonder if you've ever asked someone, gone up to someone to ask them for a favour, but you feel a little bit uncomfortable about doing this. So maybe you bring your mate along as well. And even though you want it for you, your mate doesn't care, you still say, oh, we were wondering if, whatever. See, it sounds a little bit less... If we just say we rather than I, it kind of, we kind of hide behind it a little bit, don't we? I wonder if that's what's going on here. Nick's kind of interested. He's heard about Jesus. He wants to know more, but he's a little bit scared. He doesn't want other people to know. He's a little bit embarrassed about it. He doesn't want his mates to find out, I'm sure. Maybe that's you here this morning. You're kind of interested in this Jesus guy, 
but you don't really quite know what to make of it all. Well, if you are, keep listening. There's something amazing here for all of us. So that's Nick's approach. But then we get Nick perplexed because compared to his waffle in verse 2, Jesus gets straight to the point in verse 3. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Unless one is born again. Confused? Join the club. Nick's completely confused by this. He says in verse 4, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Nick's thinking, I mean, I know how this works. I was once in my mum's belly and I had to come out. But that was years ago. I mean, I've grown quite a lot since then. He can't mean I've got to go back there again. I come out in cold sweats when I think about this because my mum's about four foot ten. I'm six foot three. Nobody wants that. What is Jesus saying? Well, I wonder if anyone's ever given you some advice. And maybe it goes something like this. Maybe you're coming down the stairs, you've just got ready to go out somewhere. And then, I don't know, maybe it's your spouse or wife or um, mum or whoever it is, takes one look at you and is like, I really think you need to look in the mirror again. You'd be like, what have I done? What's my face look like? Or maybe, I don't know, given a, you've written an email at work and you give it to your boss to have a read through and they take one look at the first paragraph and like, you really need to look at this again. You'd be like, what have I written? See, if someone says you need to do something again, it normally means something's not quite okay with you. And when Jesus says, you need to be born again, you can't get much more comprehensive than that, can you? He's saying to Nick, there's something fundamentally, deep-rootedly wrong with you, with your whole life. Being born is really closely connected to family, isn't it? We're born into a family, don't get to choose them, we just have to like it or lump it. And for Nick, family was huge, he was a Jew. A family was his ticket into God's people. But Jesus is saying here, it's not good enough. Birth is often connected to status, isn't it? Especially in more traditional cultures. You go somewhere like India, you get a really strict caste system. If you're born into a high caste, you've got everything. If you're born into a low caste, you've got no hope. Nick, again, had a high status. But Jesus is saying, no, doesn't count for anything. See, we, just like Nick, need to recognise that we're not good enough. We don't have enough. If Nick didn't, this religious, really clever guy, this Jewish ruler, then we certainly don't. Our family, it doesn't count for anything in God's economy. The good things we do, yeah, they're good, but we'll never be enough. And we need to recognise that. In, to get into the United Kingdom, you just need to hand your passport in. But it doesn't work like that in God's kingdom. But why? Well, Jesus goes on to explain a bit more about Nick's problem, our third point. He says in verse 5, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That is what is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel to you that I said to you, you must be born again. See, Jesus rephrases it. This time, instead of saying you must be born again, he gives a bit more detail. He says, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Again, maybe we're thinking, come on, Jesus, what are you saying? Why are you kind of speaking in riddles? But I think if we think about this, I think we can work out what Jesus is saying. Water was a really common Old Testament symbol for being cleansed, for being washed, I mean, like it is today, but particularly being spiritually washed. And the spirit was a really um, common symbol for life, the life that God gives. So what's Jesus saying? He's saying you need to be washed. You're spiritually dirty. And he's also saying you need to be made new. You need to have new life, i.e. you're spiritually dead. But maybe you're sitting there and you're thinking, really, Joe? Is it really that bad? I mean, I feel quite alive, thank you very much, and, and I think I'm actually quite a good person. Is it really that bad? Well, that kind of theme um, often appears in um, stories and movies, and it's got a name. 
It's called dramatic irony. Don't worry, I had to look it up too. But it's basically that time, it's quite common, when you get a, um, us as the audience know that there's a big problem around the corner. Something's not right, there's a big problem. But the characters in the movie have no idea. They're just going on with life, with oblivious to that. I mean, like in The Lion King, you get the time when Simba runs off, um, goes off with um, Pumbaa and Timon, everything's a mess, but he's having a great time. Um, what is the phrase? Akuna matata, um, have no worries for the rest of your days, all that kind of stuff. He's having a great time, but he's completely oblivious to the mess that's in the Pride Land. They need their king back. There's a big problem, but he doesn't realise it. Or in the Titanic, another classic one. They're having a great time on the boat, aren't they? They're eating and drinking and doing all this stuff. But we know that there's an iceberg with their name on it just hours, minutes, seconds away, but they don't have a clue. See, I think it's a bit like that with us. We all have a big problem, but so often we find it so hard to recognise it. But I think if we have a think, and if we're really honest with ourselves, I think we can start to see something of that problem. Think back to that symbol of washing. We might feel like we're pretty good. We might feel like we're pretty clean. But I wonder if every WhatsApp or text message you'd ever sent was published for all the world to see. I think that happened to a politician recently, didn't it? Um, that would be scary, wouldn't it? All those times you've said something not that nice about someone else behind their back on a text message. Maybe up the ante even more. Imagine if everything you'd ever said was published for all the world to see. Every time you gossiped about someone, every time you weren't really very truthful, every time you said something really nasty, but you knew they'd never hear it, if that was shown off to the whole world. And then go one step further. Imagine if everything we ever thought was published for everyone to see every disgusting thought we had about someone else, every time we got angry inside and we're like, I could kill them right now, but we just keep it in and on the surface, everything is fine. I think we can all identify with that, can't we? None of us are really that clean. And compared to God, who is perfectly holy, we come short. But then also on, on this theme of, of the spirit and life, we might think, oh yeah, my life's great, thank you very much, it's all good. Well, even in the times when life is good, I think so often it doesn't quite deliver, does it? I don't know, you look forward to a holiday and you're really looking forward to it, it's gonna be great, and you go on holiday and it, and it is good, but it, it never quite delivers, does it? Things don't quite fully satisfy us as we think they might. And then of course, life isn't always that good. Sometimes life is really, really hard. And of course, it's all pointing to that one destination in life that we're all heading to, and none of us can help it, to death itself. See, even if we find it hard to admit, we all have a problem. We're all spiritually dirty. None of us are good enough. And we're all spiritually dead, heading towards our physical death ever quicker. And the worst thing about it is that we can do nothing to solve it. We see that in verse 8. Jesus says, the wind blows where it wishes and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who's born of the Spirit. What's Jesus saying? Well, he's using a bit of a word play because in the original language, the word for spirit and the word for wind is the same. And he's saying, look at the wind, look outside. The wind's powerful, isn't it? It's amazing. It can do really big things. But we can't see it. We can't quite work out it's very difficult to predict, and we certainly can't control it. We can't harness it fully to use just for us. And so it's like that with the Spirit. The Spirit's amazingly powerful, but it's beyond our grasp, beyond our control. We can't, we'd love to be able to just pick up a book and do five simple steps and be solved, but it doesn't work like that. It's beyond our reach. Like Nick, we all have a problem, a big problem, and we can do nothing to solve it by ourselves. And I think it's important that we let this sink in. If you're here and you're not a Christian yet, maybe you never quite really understood who Jesus is, why he had to die, why Christians keep on going on about that. Maybe 
inside you're just hoping that you'll be good enough. Because you're like, well, I'm sure I'll be good enough. I'm quite a good person. Let me say gently, but with all the authority of God's word, that none of us will be good enough. None of us come up to the mark. But maybe you're here and you are a Christian. You know that Jesus had to die to forgive you. You now want to follow him. You are following him. Well, we need to keep remembering and recognising this truth. Because our hearts keep twisting and bending away from it because we don't like to hear it. Our hearts are so often like, have you ever had one of those cupboard doors where you kind of push it shut and you think it's shut and then a few seconds later it creaks back open again and then you push it shut again and back it comes open again. Our hearts try and wriggle out of this because we don't want to hear it. We don't want to come face to face with it. See, on a Sunday, it's so easy to sing, Jesus, I need you, I need you every day. But then it's very difficult to live like that. Think about our prayer life. If we really understood that we can do absolutely nothing in our own strength, every breath we take, let alone everything we do, is completely dependent on our Father, man, we would pray differently, wouldn't we, if we really let that truth sink in. Or think about how fickle we often are. We have a couple of good days. We manage not to lose our temper. We manage to, I don't know, be kind to our family. We, things seem to be going really well, and we're, we're rejoicing. But inside, we're also thinking, God, I've done really well. God must be so pleased with me at the moment. And then the next day, we have a bad day. I don't know, we lose our temper. We fall to that same sin again, and we're utterly broken and feel like we've got no hope. Because we haven't quite let that truth sink down that no matter what we do, we need Jesus. Every day we need Jesus. On our best day, we need Jesus. And on our worst day, we need to let that sink deep in. But there's also an amazing hope here. There's an amazing promise. And this is what Jesus now comes on to. Because Nicodemus is still really confused in verse 9. How can these things be? Jesus says to him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? Here it comes. No one has ascended into heaven Well, that's just what we've been saying, isn't it? None of us are good enough to get to heaven. Except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. That's Jesus. What's he saying? Well, I think it's like an image of a rock climber. I think we've got a picture. Um, I'm not very good at rock climbing. I've had a couple of goes. I find it really hard. But some people are incredible at it. And I think this guy is like that. That looks such a sheer rock face, doesn't it? But somehow he managed to cling on and pull himself up on the smallest of grip holds. And maybe sometimes we think that life's a bit like that. We can just gradually, if we're good enough, we can find the ways to find those little handholds and pull ourselves up. But the Bible says, no, it doesn't work like that. It's like a rock face that is so incredibly steep and so incredibly smooth, none of us can even hope to get to the top of it. And maybe we think, well, if someone managed to get to the top, they could throw a rope down, and then we'd be able to climb up, and then we'd be fine. But I think the Bible would say, well, no, it's more like we're at the bottom of that really steep, really smooth rock face, and we've broken both our legs and both our arms. Even if someone threw a rope down, we would not be able to climb it. Our only hope? Someone who could come down, all the way down to the very bottom, and pull us up, into their big arms, lift us up, and then carry us back up there. Or maybe, I don't know, have a jet pack and can just zoom us back up there. That is our only hope. And that is exactly what Jesus has done. He was with the Father. He was perfect, in perfect relationship with the Father from all eternity. Yet he came all the way down to this earth to hang out with people like that Samaritan woman, people broken, People messy, people just like us. 
And then he was lifted up, as he goes on to say in verse 14, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And yes, of course, Jesus ascended back to the Father, but first he was lifted up in a different way, lifted up on the earth, as they lifted him on a cross to die. As he bore his whole body weight on those nails on his hands and his feet, which would gradually suffocate him to death. But he he bore more than just his own weight, didn't he? He bore all of ours too. Everything we've ever done wrong, everything that we've ever thought wrong, every attitude we've said that says to God, no, we don't want you. If we're trusting in Jesus, he bore those for us. He paid the price in full. It cost him his very life. And yet on his dying breath he said, it is finished. They've all gone, taken away. And now he can pick us up and carry us to the Father. He is now leading us home and one day we will come home and be with him forever. That's the amazing good news that we have in Jesus. So if you're here and you're not a Christian, the Bible isn't just another self-help book. It's not just another set of 10 rules to help you live better. It's not just about being good enough. No, it's all about Jesus. It's all about what he has done for us. And what does he call us to do? Well, simply to recognize that we're not good enough ourselves, recognize that we need Jesus and turn and look to him. Look to him there dying on the cross and say, Jesus, I need you. And he promises that he will give us life. He'll take our sins and throw them away. He'll wash us clean. He'll give us the power to live differently. He'll change our desires. He'll help us as we recognize how much he loves us to start loving God and each other. But if you are a Christian, we mustn't move on from this. There's nowhere else for us to go. This is our hope. It doesn't get better than this. Because it's only here that we find true rest, true gratitude, true joy, true power, true hope. True rest, because it doesn't rely on ourselves anymore. There's nothing that we can do that can mean God will stop loving us as much as he does. It doesn't depend on us. We can rest in what he's already done for us. True gratitude, because everything we have is from God. The very breath that we breathe, but also the gifts he's given us, the opportunities he's given us, the material stuff he's given us, everything is from God. Man, we'd be more grateful if we recognised that more, wouldn't we? We find true joy, because the best joy of all is knowing our Father loves us more than we can ever know or imagine. True power, because that spirit who is so powerful that we cannot grasp on our own strength, God gives as a gift to us into our hearts, and it is he who is transforming us. Yes, we walk in step with his spirit, but the power rests in God, in us. And lastly, there we find true hope. Because there will never be a day when we stand there, like I imagine standing for the border guard, lonely on my own, fumbling around, realizing I don't have my passport. It won't be like that. Yes, we'll stand before God himself, and we'll be utterly hopeless on our own merit but then we'll feel a touch on our shoulder and next to us will be Jesus his arm on our shoulder and God won't look at us he'll look at Jesus he'll say to Jesus you are my son you did everything perfectly welcome come in and Jesus will lead us into everlasting life see Who is part of God's people? Who is part of God's kingdom? Nick thought he was good enough by himself, but he was intrigued as to who Jesus was. But Jesus had a tough message for him. You're not good enough, mate. You can't do it by yourself. But then we see Jesus' amazing 
promise. That for all those who recognize they're not good enough and who put their trust in Jesus, who recognize they need him and say to him, please save me, there is hope of eternal life. There is our strength to live. There is the hope to carry us on. Oh, may we know that truth more and more for ourselves. Shall I pray? And then I'll hand back over. Father God, we thank you so much that you did not leave us in our dirty, dead, sinful state. But you sent your own son from your glory down to this earth. And we see in his life, he cared about the broken people, the people who recognized they needed help. Oh Lord, our hearts so quickly move away from this. We quickly try and think we're good enough ourselves. We can do it in our own strength. Help us to again realize deeper than ever that we can do nothing in our own strength, but that you have done it for us and you are doing it with us now. It's in your power that we live and we keep trusting. Help us to know that and to know the true hope and joy it is to be in your son. Thank you for that grace that we see in you. In Jesus' name, amen.